The ringing of the bells calls us into worship for Sunday morning has dawned once again. Morning has broken. So welcome to all who are worshiping with us this day. And I pray God's blessing upon you in our time of worship in the rest of this day. As we worship this morning, I want to read to you Hebrews 13, verse 15, which says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. As we are taking the time on Sunday morning to worship God, we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, and so we sacrifice our time in this aspect of worship. But not just our time, we're, we're called to give our hearts, our thoughts, our blessing to the Lord. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious God, loving Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. We thank you that we have your holy word to read, to remind us to continually offer to you a sacrifice of praise. Lord, may the words and the thoughts of our mouths and our minds bring you glory and honor this day. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to unite us together as we worship and sing and pray to you. Amen. For the glorious creation God has made, let us sing for the beauty of the earth. Oh, 
And now let us sing together, He Leadeth Me. continue to let God leads, lead us. I invite the children to pay attention a little bit, maybe more, in this children's moment that we have. It's a continuation from last Sunday when I had three boxes with three special words on it, and we're going to add three more boxes today. But I first want to read to you the word from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7. For this very reason, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly and sisterly kindness, and to brotherly and sisterly kindness love. So from last Sunday, we had our beginning stack of boxes where we have word, the word faith, as the foundation of everything that we are about, our, our faith in God. And on top of that, we have the word goodness, which is the fruit of our faith through God. And on top of goodness is the word knowledge, that we're always trying to grow in more knowledge of God our Heavenly Father. Well, these are virtues, these are elements of character that we need to have as we grow and grow older. And so those are the first three. And in our scripture reading, the fourth word, the next box, is the one called self-control. Self-control is something that happens on the inside of us, the inside of a person. That we are able to control what we think, what we say, what we do. Now many don't have that, that inner kind of self-control, and that's why we have all kinds of rules and laws and commandments to follow. But for those of us that have self-control and we grow in self-control based on our knowledge of the Word of God, it can be like maybe we're upset and we're gonna, we think we're going to say something mean to our parents or mean to one of our friends, but our self-control prevents us from actually saying those words. That inner aspect tells us 
This is not what we're supposed to say, and so we don't say. That's exercising self-control, taking care of our impulses, our passions, our desires, so that we're not saying something wrong or bad, but we are pleasing God. To self-control, we add the next virtue character of faith, and that is of patience. We have to exercise patience in almost every aspect of life. When I think about patience, I think of Noah from the Old Testament. That Noah had to have great patience. When God asked him or commanded him to build the ark, then once it was done and he filled it with all those creatures and his family, then it started to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. As you add up the time, it was 370 days that Noah and his family and the creatures were on the ark. 370 days. That's more than a year. And as Noah went through the rain, then it stopped. And then he had to wait for the floodwaters to recede. And then he had to wait for the earth to dry up so that everybody could come off of the ark. He had to have great patience. We have to have that sense of patience in our lives too. And then the sixth virtue, the top word we're going to have today, is that of godliness. Godliness is that call for Christians to be godly in our lives. And God sent us his son Jesus to teach us and to be a great example for us about being godly and having godliness in our lives. Now, Jesus was God's son. He was perfect. He was without sin. We know that we can't be perfect, and unfortunately, we know we're going to sin, but we still have to try and work at being more godly all of the time. That aspect of self-control and not saying harmful things, that's when we are being more godly. And when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus forgave people. Even when he was on the cross, he prayed that God would forgive those that put him on the cross. And so, in godliness, we have to be able to forgive others who have harmed us. As we look at the life of Jesus and godliness, Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a lot, all the time. And so, we have to be praying a lot, all the time. Let's pray now. Lord, help us to be more godly in these virtues and others, these characters, these elements of, of character, that we can grow in wisdom and love to serve you and to honor you. In Christ we pray. Amen. We continue in the aspect and ministry of prayer as we come into a pastoral time this morning. Uh, if you've gone online and looked at our bulletin where we have devotionals, the order of service, we also have our concern list. And you can see that we've added Larry Kinsman uh, to the list. He had um, heart valve replacement surgery on Wednesday. That surgery went very well. He's most likely in the hospital through this weekend. But we can be praying for Larry and his wife Candy in this time. Let us bow before the Lord in prayer. Lord, in times of trial and trouble, when life is difficult and different, when routine and income and fellowship are disrupted. At such times, we can have the tendency to allow our circumstances to rule our lives, causing us to forsake you, to take our eyes off of Jesus, allowing the wind and the waves of life's storms to overwhelm us. As what happened to Peter when he stepped out of the boat that one day long ago. So in this time of prayer, May your spirit cause each of us to stop, to be mentally motionless, to release our worries and our fears and even our wants, giving them to you, trusting in your plan, in your care, in your providence. In our choice to worship you in this hour, O oh God, I pray for your spirit to break through the difficulties of our lives. May we each not be overwhelmed with circumstances, but instead enable us to observe your beauty and your greatness. That we might bring blessing to your name, for you are holy. May your glory be declared in these days, in the bursting forth of springtime, 
with the beauty of flowers and the budding of trees with the excitement that comes from crops breaking through the soil. With warmer temperatures and brighter days, Lord, with faith and perseverance and strength, with wonder, we praise your name and proclaim your salvation day after day. And in our concern for one another, today we pray for those who are at greater risk in regards to the coronavirus. Whether that greater risk be due to age or profession or underlying health conditions. We pray that people will live and act in peace, in health, in compassion, in regard for one another. Lord, I'm mindful of the time when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. May we love one another as you intend. As Jesus placed us above his own life. As he humbled himself in being a servant. Lord, may we have such love. That it's not about what we desire individually, but it's about the good of all. Lord, we lift up to you Larry and Candy as Larry continues to recover from this recent surgery. Lord, we thank you that uh, the doctors, the nurses, the staff, the technicians were all there to provide that time of surgery upon Larry's heart. And in this time of recovery, Lord, may he know the presence of your Holy Spirit and the strength of your healing upon him. Lord, I pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the wonder of how the Spirit connects us together, Lord, we pray for a sense of unity in prayer as we pray the Lord, the Lord's Prayer with us now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In my preparations for the sermon this week, I came across an object lesson for children based on Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. It's a lesson that I want to share to stimulate your faith in thinking this, or your faith thinking this morning. As you live in this world, you become aware that there are natural disasters that just happen. And there have been many in the recent past. Floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and, and earthquakes and forest fires. Disasters happen quickly, without warning. And we are constantly hearing that it's so important to be prepared in case of an emergency. Certainly in regards to the coronavirus pandemic, we have been hearing over and over again that it's so important to be prepared. In the first days of the pandemic, when it was put out there that we need to be sanitizing everything, including our hands, our sent Kelly, our administrative assistant to the store, to find some larger bottles of hand sanitizer. She texted me back that every store in Archbold was out, and the only thing that she could find were some small little personal vials at some of the local gas stations. Now that kind of made me think about, well, how am I going to find this hand sanitizer? And I remembered some, somewhere in the church I had seen a larger bottle. So I walked around all of the Sunday school rooms, the Faith Village supply cabinets. I checked the youth room, the fireside room, the gym, the kitchen. And we had plenty of hand sanitizer on hand in large bottles. Someone had been about the preparations that we would need to keep things sanitized. It wasn't me, but somebody else in the church had all of the supplies here. They were prepared. But Jesus once told a story to teach us the importance of being prepared. In his story, there are ten bridesmaids who took their oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Jesus said five of them were foolish because they had their lamps, but they didn't bring any extra oil to put in the lamps. So when it was time to go out to meet the bridegroom, 
they were out of oil. The other five were wise because they were well prepared. They brought plenty of oil for their lamps. So when it was time to go out and meet the bridegroom, they were ready. In this story, the bridegroom is Jesus, and you and I, Christians, are the bridesmaids. The story is teaching us that one day we are going to meet Jesus. It teaches us that we must be prepared because we don't know when Jesus is coming again. Do you know what it takes to be prepared? Do you know what we must do to be prepared to meet Jesus when he returns? We must invite Jesus to come into our hearts. We have to invite him in. When we do, we're going to be ready. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, one day we're going to each meet you face to face. We pray that we will all be ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture from this morning is the gospel from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It is the parable of the ten virgins, or another title, a parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. So Matthew 25, verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to seat and to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they cried, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. How ready were you? How ready were you for not only the coronavirus pandemic, but also for the stay at home and social distancing restrictions? When news of the pandemic began to affect our daily lives here in Northwest Ohio, back in that second week of March, how ready were you with those PPE supplies? <clears throat> Excuse me or with cleaning supplies, or with health supplies, even food supplies? How ready, how prepared were you to have your checking account and your saving accounts so that you could have funds to weather through these days? Now please notice, I'm specifically asking if you were ready. I'm not asking about whether the, gar the government was ready or how prepared the medical world or how well employers or even the church were prepared. How prepared were you? That's the question I'm asking. For ready or not, the pandemic came and the reality of the shutting down of society, the unexpectedness of the whole situation, it all came about. The scope of the virus and the measures of response to, quote, flatten the curve were unexpected too, but were you ready? Or do you think you'll be ready the next time or more prepared the next time? I'm normally a pretty detailed planning type of person, but there are plenty of preparations I still have to go through as I live in this world. Last, when, last winter, I got a phone call early in the morning that someone had slid off the road into a ditch and they called me and wondered if I could come with my truck to help pull them out of the ditch. 
And so I hurriedly got up and, and said, sure, I'll go. I made sure that I had the tow strap in my truck and off I went to find where the guy had slid off the road. Now, a couple of miles down the road, I wished that I had grabbed my cell phone in case I couldn't find the right location. It would have been nice to have been able to, to call him, but I did find uh, the place and there he was, truck slid off the road, a smaller truck. So I got there and as we started to connect this tow strap to both vehicles, I realized it would have been nice to have uh, work gloves. It would have been great to have a flashlight to see underneath the vehicles. It would have been wonderful to have some of those uh, flashing lights or road flares to warn the traffic that was driving by. But we didn't. I wasn't prepared. But all went well as the other vehicle easily pulled out of the ditch and nobody sideswiped us. But in the days that followed, I made sure that I got to the store and I put together a safety kit that now is in my truck right next to my first aid kit so that I am prepared for the next time. Prepared for the next time. Prepared for the next time. Why have I said that three times? When Jesus was resurrected and he was having breakfast with his disciples after the miraculous catch of fish, Jesus asked Peter three different times if he loved him. It's a chance for us to deeply think, are we prepared for the next time? When you lay that thought, that reality, when you lay that statement over the meaning of the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins, we realize there may not be a next time. There won't be a next time. We have to be ready now. As a result of COVID-19, a few people have called me up because they wanted to talk about the end times, whether that was the end of their physical life here on this earth or the second coming of Christ. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted to be ready. And so those conversations prompted the decision to preach on this passage of Matthew 25. To help us understand some of the background of the parable, it's important for us to have some knowledge of the customs surrounding Jewish weddings of that day. Jewish weddings were often arranged by parents of the bride and groom when the boy and the girl were still very young. The parents made that promise that when the children, when the boy and the girl became of age, they promised that the marriage would go through. Well, as the boy reached adulthood, he was learning a trade, most likely from his father, so that he could have an income. And as he started to make that money, he would then begin to build the house where he and his bride would eventually live. And when that house was finished, then the bridegroom would gather his friends and they'd make kind of a parade throughout the streets of the city until they came to the home of his bride. Well, in the meantime, while the boy was learning his trade and growing into a man and building the house, the young woman was also getting ready. She was preparing herself. She was learning to become a woman and a wife and a mother. She was making her wedding gown and she was gathering some of those necessary household items so that she would be ready. But since she didn't know the day or the time when her bridegroom would be coming in that parade with the friends to come and get her, she had to be ready at all times. Now, she knew in a general sense of way when the time might be coming, but she didn't know the actual day or time. So she learned as a bride to be ready at all times. It was not going to be a very good way to start the wedding if the bridegroom came and she wasn't prepared. So she was ready. And if she was ready, off the couple went to the bridegroom's family house so that they could enjoy the wedding ceremony and then the wedding supper for the close friends and the family of the couple. After the ceremony and after that supper, there would be a wedding celebration for which the whole town would be invited for the night's entertainment in celebration. In the parable that Jesus tells, we don't get all of the details. We don't get the full timing of the wedding. We don't learn why the bridegroom was delayed. In the parable, there's not even a mention of the bride. The ten virgins were the bridesmaids who would be assisting the bride in that day. 
Those ten, described as virgins, they would have been young women themselves who had not already been married. With the parable of the bridal party, with the parade of the bridal party going through the streets, in the evening and at night, lamps or torches would have been necessary to walk along the dark streets and the alleyways, and so each person was responsible for providing their own source of light. Those lights, those lamps, could have been a metal or clay-filled, oil-fed lamp, or it could have been a torch with rags that would have been soaked in oil wrapped around it. Each of the ten brought a lamp. Five of them brought a jar of extra oil, while five of them figured that the oil in the lamp or the oil in the rags would be enough. Five of the women were prepared for a delay. The other five must not even have thought about a delay. And as those ten bridesmaids waited, the groom was delayed and the day got late and the women grew tired and the ten fell asleep. And then at midnight, the ten were suddenly awakened for it was time to go out and see the groom. The ten were ready. They were there, even though they had fallen asleep. So they got up and they grabbed their lamps and that's when the ten became two distinct groups of five. The five who didn't bring any extra oil realized as they trim, trimmed their lamps, they were about to go out. And so they did what was natural. They asked the five who had brought extra oil to share so they could fill their lamps. Now, we have to be careful here and not judge the five wise bridesmaids who came prepared. Were they too harsh? And not sharing their oil? Aren't we supposed to share and be kind to others, loving our neighbors as ourselves? We'll come back to those questions in a few minutes. The five wise bridesmaids, who have must have known that a delay could happen, having brought extra oil, they were able to go out and meet the groom. But the five unprepared, foolish bridesmaids they had to go somewhere to find extra oil at midnight. We don't know how long it took them to get more oil, but by the time they did, it was too late. The bridegroom had arrived, the five wise young women had gone into the banquet, and the door was shut. As with any parable Jesus talked with, there is some tremendous imagery in his words. Images that his listeners would seem to be, well, would be able to clearly understand. Let's unpack this parable a bit. The bridegroom's coming speaks to the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself. That he is coming again. He's promised to come a second time. But we don't know when. The ten virgins, the bridesmaids, they represent the Christian community. The followers of Christ who are awaiting his return. Verse 5 tells us that the bridegroom was a long time in coming. He was delayed for some unknown reason. And the bridesmaids had to await his arrival. I don't know that the second coming of Christ is delayed. For his return is fully in the hands of our Heavenly Father. But we do have a sense that it's been a long time coming, don't we? I mean, those first Christians, they thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime, and yet Jesus has still not come. It's been a long time coming, but we have to have patience. We have to have perseverance. The five wise virgins were deemed wise because they not only brought their lamps, they also brought a jar of extra oil. The five foolish virgins were described as foolish because they only brought their lamps in. They didn't bring anything extra. But why didn't the five wise share with the five foolish? We don't know how much extra oil they brought. But evidently they only brought enough to refill their own lamps. The difference between the two distinct groups of five. Five were prepared. Five were not. To fully understand why the five wise couldn't share their oil, we have to remember what Jesus is teaching through the parable. 
The phrase in verse 10, and the door was shut. The door was shut. That's a very telling statement. The door was shut and it wasn't going to be reopened. Those who had entered in with the bridegroom, they were in. The rest were left out and they were not going to be let in. The parable is an allegorical lesson on the return of Christ. Jesus was using the ordinary customs of a Jewish wedding to teach the people about the end times. When Christ returns, it will be a time of judgment, a time of final judgment, and the door to the kingdom of God will be shut. After all, the faithful, the prepared, are in. The five wise, they could not share their oil. Their foresight and preparedness, they cannot benefit the foolish. When the end time comes, when Christ returns, each person has to be ready, has to be prepared. The preparedness of the ready cannot be transferred or shared. It's this point I was speaking to when I specifically asked if you were ready for the pandemic. The response of the five wise bridesmaids was not a calloused response or a rejection of the five foolish ones. But there is coming a time when it's too late to help others. That time's not here right now, so we still help one another. But there will become a time when it's too late to help others. This parable is about the consummation. The consummation of the kingdom of God at the arrival of Jesus Christ when all written about in the scriptures will be fulfilled. The imagery of the parable points to when the bridegroom, the son of man, Jesus Christ, when Christ returns. Christians, we are to be preparing for that arrival, for his arrival. Like the bridesmaids kept watch for the bridegroom, we have to keep watch for Christ's return, since we don't know when it will be. It can happen at any time, which isn't of any concern if we are going about being prepared, if we've made the appropriate preparations. Keep watch doesn't mean to stay awake. Keep watch means to be prepared. So we have to keep watching. We have to keep being prepared. In this parable, we have to deal with the anguished cry of the five foolish bridesmaids. Once they were able to refill their lamps, they came to the home of the bridegroom, but they found that door closed. So they cried out, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But they were told he didn't know them. They wouldn't be allowed in. The ill-prepared, the late arrivals, they were starkly rejected. It's been said that the shut door points to hell. Those who are not properly prepared, they're going to be rejected. They will be left out. Those who have never made proper preparations for the promised coming of the kingdom of God will be shut out of the eternal kingdom of heaven. The words in the parable, I don't know you, they hearken back to the words of Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, when Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. The point of learning I want to stress with you this morning is to remember that the ten virgins, they each brought their lamps. The ten were watching and waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. All ten thought they were ready. They thought they were prepared. But only five were. The other five weren't. When the five foolish virgins were shut out, it drew a picture of the stark rejection of a person who does not have a true relationship with Jesus Christ. It goes back to that earlier object lesson that we have to invite Jesus Christ into our hearts. Just watching and waiting isn't enough. As the five wise brought the extra oil with them, 
we have to bring the extra with us. Those virtues and those disciplines to enter through the door with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. We cannot delay being ready. We cannot put it off. We cannot think about being prepared the next time. We have to be prepared now. Many people delay repenting of their sin until later, thinking they will have time. Many say that they're going to focus on the relationship with Christ next week or next month, thinking that that will be soon enough. But a person's own sudden, unexpected death or the return of Jesus himself will find many to be unrepentant sinners. So the call of this parable is to be wise, is to be prepared now. Let's pray. Lord, through this teaching, I pray that people would wrestle with this reality of not putting anything off in faith, but to be prepared now to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, to pray for his guidance and his grace upon our lives. And Lord, with that knowledge, with that acceptance, help us to grow in these virtues that we've been talking about these last couple of Sundays. Lord, may we continue to mature in faith that we are ready for when Jesus comes. In his name we pray. Amen. In the words of the benediction, remember this truth and this promise. That the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.